All right, so the stuff you guys really want to learn about. Um, anterior preparations, okay? Um, yeah, I mean, the principle's pretty similar, right? We talk about posterior teeth. You take a burr, you grind a little bit on top, grind a little bit circumferentially, slap a little temporary material, call it a day, right? So pretty similar. Let's just go through some of the parameters that we have for our uh, PFM crowns. So instead of our occlusal reduction of 1.5 millimeters, we're going to do a 2 millimeter reduction of, of inc at the incisal edge. So the way you'll do this is you'll take a burr. Um, so our KR burr, how wide is that at the end of the shank? Um, so at the tip it's 1.2, but how about the other end of it? About 1.8, okay? So if you want to use that as a guideline, you can sink the burr at its thickest portion down its full length and then maybe just a little bit more. Or you can just save that 0.2 millimeters when you end up finishing it. You can probably remove that 0.2, okay? So the reason why we need um, a little bit more reduction there is because that anterior area is a little bit more demanding in terms of aesthetics. So as you look at the incisal edge of your teeth, you notice that it gets uh, much more translucent than maybe a cuss tip, right? So again, we still got to make room for metal. This is, again, still a PFM crown. We still got to make room for our opaque, but then now we also have our dent and enamel layer that we could use an extra 0.5 millimeters um, to get that aesthetic looking porcelain, right? Our facial shoulder, still the same, 1.2 millimeters. And then our lingual uh, chamfer is at 0.5 because we can do a metal color on that lingual surface because it's a not aesthetic a non-aesthetic zone. Um, so this wall here is going to be real tall. I want you to pay attention to this wall here. This is the challenge in the anterior region is keeping the anatomy of the tooth. So remember, we, try, we want to try to get an, as even reduction as we can. But this lingual axial wall, we want to maintain some height here. All right. So remember, we talked about the um, total occlusal convergence of your two walls and your height to base ratio have an impact on your retention resistance form. So your resistance form, remember the difference between retention versus resistance? Right, so retention describes as you're pulling it away parallel to the uh, path of withdrawal or the long axis of the tooth and the resistance is any motion that's not parallel. So when you think about it, any tipping force. So you can see here that this wall and the taper and the height is important to maintain so that we get uh, a better uh, resistance form. So see how that differs from our posterior preparation where both the buccal and lingual walls um, were of similar heights. In this situation, because it's an anterior tooth and the anatomy, uh, this wall is obviously a little bit shorter. Um, so we want to make sure that we got um, some parallelism um, or some a good taper, a minimal taper between the two walls and not to um, over taper it so it's just one, a blending of this whole surface, okay? So pay attention to that. I'm sure we'll show a bunch of pictures. Um, the idea of your second plane of reduction still applies and this is probably even more important here in your anterior tooth. So you can see the color difference here. You got the blue towards the gingival half and then the red is um, your second plane and that's towards the middle to incisal half. So when you stick your burr in, so I'll show you from a different angle, it's probably a little better to see. So again, you're going to use your KR burr, um, that's 1.2 at the tip to do this. Um, so first plane, you see the angulation of the tooth and the second plane is a little bit more vertical. All right. So definitely in this inch or two, um, don't skip your depth groove um, uh, step here, okay? Um, because once you're going to lose orientation of where you are if you don't put in this second plane depth groove. You're not going to know how deep to put that. Because what's the disadvantage of under-reducing in the axial surface on the facial hair? No? Okay. So I'll repeat that. Somebody said that it's going to... Um, the opaque layer is going to show through a little bit more, right? 
So if you built that crown to the proper contour, there's not enough porcelain there to make it look nice. Um, or if you make it look nice, it's going to be over contoured, meaning that, well, you had to bulk out the facial surface more than you wanted to, um, just so that you can make it look aesthetic with the porcelain. Okay? So um, it's either going to be unesthetic because the opaque layer, um, or two, it's going to be over contoured and it's going to be more bulky um, than you wished. Okay? So two plane reduction on the facial, we're going to be looking out for that. And we're going to be repeating that, I'm sure, over and over again the first day. All right, so we talked about incisal edge reduction, two millimeters. Um, this is the challenging part, I feel like. The, the lingual margin, maybe not so, but then getting your depth groove on your lingual surface, okay? Um, that's a little bit hard to visualize. And it may be a little harder because you're using indirect vision too because you got your mirror down there. Um, but the suggestion is to use the coarse football di diamond to um, uh, reduce your lingual surface. Okay. So we can keep that lingual surface, remember, in a couple different materials. We can either do metal or porcelain. So uh, in our case, we're doing a metal um, lingual surface. So your contact point where your incisal edge of your mandibular tooth is hitting the lingual surface is going to be in metal. Remember how far away from the metal ceramic junction do we want to keep that transition? 1.5. So you don't want them hitting close to where the metal transitions to the porcelain. Okay? If you're doing something porcelain back there um, with a PFM, obviously you're going to need a little bit more reduction. Okay, so, um, but in a non-aesthetic area, um, generally we like to keep things contacting metal if we can, because um, it's just more conservative with the preparation as well as uh, less, the less porcelain you have on these things, the less likely porcelain is going to chip. Okay, um, so that's sort of the anterior prep. And then similar -ish, uh, things as you go in approximately, this is going to be easier to get through in approximately because you can see a nice, a wider embrasure space. And again, you want to keep, uh, the hard part is keeping the um, gingival margin, or your, your margin, kind of in the same contour as your gingival margin with that shoulder burr. So it's, hard to put, it's harder to put curves in that compared to your chamfer burr. Um, but as you get in approximately, uh, one, you'll be able to see a little bit better <laughs> and it will be less um, chance of you over tapering because you're looking straight down at number eight um, when you start that. Um, but you can still use that skinny uh, chamfer burr to break the contact first and then carry um, a thicker burr through there once you've broken the contact. Okay? Um, one of the things that you'll be doing as you get into the clinic too is this idea of a diagnostic wax up. So sometimes patients come in <clears throat> and then their teeth don't look like you would want them to. And you want them to, you want to make them a provisional that obviously looks pretty nice because it's a preview of what the final is going to look like. Okay? So let's say a patient comes in, they had chipped like the incisal edge of number eight. Right? So if we did our provisionals the same way that you guys have been doing on your posterior teeth, they're going to walk away with a tooth that essentially looks exactly the same as they walked in. right? Um, so in order to improve upon that aesthetics, what we can do is get uh, basically a diagnostic cast or a diagnostic impression. So every time your patient first comes to our clinic, you're going to do a whole comprehensive exam. One of the things that you're going to be doing is making molds of their mouth so you can pour it up. And then on that stone cast, what you could do is add wax to it to make it look ideal. Right? So the area that was chipped, well, you start waxing up your tooth, similar to what you guys did in your occlusion class with Dr. Okoria. So you guys remember that little exercise? You got a little bit of wax. Okay? Um, so once you got the tooth waxed up to the form that you like, then you can make a um, stent of it. And that can be done in many different ways. Uh, we've taught you how to do, with, do it with uh, the PVS material. Um, 
This is also a PVS material that you see here, this blue putty material. And this is stuff that we've played with in our dental materials class, right? And what category of material is this? It's a PVS, and there's two types of PVS materials, right? How do we categorize that? Addition and condensation. So the PVS that we had been using to make your final impressions, which one was that? Addition. And then we know that this is condensation by elimination, right? Um, so what do we know about condensation PVS? Well, they have a byproduct. So this is why we don't use this material as a final impression, because since it has a byproduct, it's not going to be dimensionally stable. It turns out that this byproduct is ethyl alcohol. Okay. So you're going to have slight dimensional change in this material. So good for provisionals, right? It doesn't have to be so accurate that we're going to make a final off of it. Um, but certainly not accurate enough to use as our definitive material to make a final impression uh, for final crowns. Right? So this material you'll have, Pedro will have this in the back. You're going to get a scoop of the blue, a scoop of the white. So one's a catalyst, one's a base. You're going to mash it together with your fingers, kind of like Play-Doh. And then you're going to essentially put it onto your tooth uh, to make an index or a mold of that before you prep it. And that's what you're going to use to fabricate your provisional. All right, let's talk about biologic width. So this is a subject that we've touched upon before, right? Uh, and I think you guys have gotten some of it in your perio class. So the combined width of the connective tissue and junctional epithelium. Um, so as pretend you're the probe, and you guys have, have you guys started probing yet in your clinical orientation, right? So as you stick your probe in, to the sulcus, that's the first thing that that probe touches, right? So there's a little space or a pocket that we're trying to measure. So that's our gingival sulcus. If we were to carry that probe further, what are you going to hit? The junctional epithelium. And that's a hemidesmosomal attachment, right? So that could be severed if you probe too much, right? And once you pass that junctional epithelium, what are you going to hit? Connective tissue, okay? So sulcus, junction epithelium, connective tissue. That's what you have to repeat to yourself over and over again until you memorize it, okay? So once again, sulcus, junction epithelium, connective tissue. And that junction epithelium layer, that's held together by hemidesmosomal attachments. All right, so um, the idea is um, how this relates to us is where do we want to put our margin? So we know that there's uh, three different layers you can think of it in our uh, gingival complex. So again, sulcus, junction epithelium, connective tissue. Out of those three things, the connective tissue plus the junction of the epithelium, we're going to consider that or call that the biologic width of the tooth. So the average biologic width is two millimeters. So a anatomically average person, they're going to have about a millimeter uh, per segment here. So your sulcus is about a millimeter, junction of epithelium about a millimeter, connective tissue about a millimeter. All right. But this can vary. So this slide is just saying that sometimes your biologic width from patient to patient and tooth to tooth could be a little bit different. So in this situation, our Connective tissue layer is two millimeters, thus making our biologic width three. Right? But the total distance from the bone to the free gingival margin, that would be four. So it's just math. I know a lot of you guys got into dentistry because you guys hated math, but we got to do a little bit of adding and subtracting. I won't make you take the inverse tangent to find out the angle of a burr, but I'll ask you to do some arithmetic. Okay. Right, so how do we measure a patient's biologic width? Because we obviously can't take a cross-section of their tooth and then their bone and their gingiva, like we were looking at before. So we got to get find a way to measure that uh, a different way. Well, the sulcus step you guys have done before. That's your periodontal probing. The question is, well, what other number can we get? Well, the other number that you can get is what we call 
sounding to bone. So you take a probe. Actually, before you do that, you want to numb the patient up in that um, area. So you anesthetize the soft tissue. Then you take the probe, and then you just jam it into the sulcus, and you stuff that down until you hit something hard. So the probe is going to sever through your junctional epithelium plus your connective tissue layer. Yeah. <laughs> just jam it in there. Okay. And then when you hit bone, then you can measure the distance from the bone to your free gingival margin. Right? So that's the measurement you get for sounding to bone. So that number minus the sulcus depth will give you your measurement for biologic width. So obviously you can't really tell how, so let's say your sounding to bone is four millimeters and your sulcus depth is one, well how wide is your biologic width? Three. So out of those three millimeters it's hard to tell how much of that is your junctional epithelium and connective tissue, but you know that combined it's three millimeters. All right? So that's a number, the biologic width is something that, um, one, you'll want to know how to measure if you need to, um, because the thing that will happen is sometimes we violate this biologic width. And we're going to show an example of that coming up. All right, so here's an example of an anterior tooth with a crown that's prepped to the free gingival margin. So this is our equigingival scenario, which we like because it's, um, easier to get an impression compared to a subgingival, and it's aesthetic because we're hiding the transition between the tooth and the crown. Um, but there's times where we have to go a little bit deeper than we want, and we go subgingival. And we may go so subgingival or intracravicular that we end up in the junctional epithelium. So what are a couple reasons why we may need to go deeper um, with our crown margin than we would want. Okay, so if we're chasing caries, right? At some point, you got to remove all that unhealthy tooth structure. So you can imagine, like our, let's say you have a class five restoration. Right? Sometimes you got to go subgingival there because it's at the gum line and the tooth has um, demineralized below the gum line. So yeah, sometimes our caries goes beyond the sulcus and into this region. So you got to prep that way because obviously you want the crown to be sitting on sound tooth structure. Uh, another scenario would be sometimes a tooth, let's say your cusp, uh, like in a cusp tip in a posterior example, you have a big MOD and the facial cusp fractures off. Well, sometimes the fracture of that tooth, right, the part that it snaps off at is going to be below the gum line from time to time. Right? So in those cases, then you're sort of forced into having your margin meet the area that, where the break occurred. Um, but most commonly, you're probably going to find some sort of uh, caries is probably the number one reason. Or sometimes, just as the operator, you make a mistake and you go a little bit deeper than you want. So an iatrogenic issue, right? So you as a provider, um, kind of elicited that violation of the biologic width. So in this case here, let's say this carries, we had to extend our margin deeper than we want. We would call this an invasion of biologic width, where the biologic width is violated. So when the margin is placed within the biologic width. So the question is, well, what happens when this biologic width is violated? And the answer is, you get inflammation in that area, and then you have the potential for unpredictable bone loss. So let's read this real quick. One possibility is that bone loss of an unpredictable nature along with gingival tissue recession. So one of the principles you uh, will know, may want to know is that as the bone disappears, then the gum tissue will also follow where the bone is. So if you have some bone loss, a lot of times you're going to see the tissue also recede. Because, of course, the bone supports the soft tissue. Okay? So that's why they say, along with gingival tissue recession occurs as the body attempts to recreate room between the alveolar bone and the margin to allow space for tissue reattachment. So the body 
has this two millimeters of biologic width that it likes to have between any restorative material and the bone. And when you violate that, then it gets angry. And it shows you it's angry by turning the tissue red and then having the bone disappear. Okay. Um, so we're also going to talk about, so let me finish reading this. This is more likely to occur in areas um, in which the alveolar bone surrounding the tooth is very thin in its width. So other factors that may impact the likelihood of a recession include whether the gingiva is thick and fibrotic or if it's thin um, and fragile. So we'll talk about gingival biotype. There's differing biotypes. Have you guys heard that word from your perio? Okay. And then two, you also have this idea of highly scalped and flat um, or flat in its gingival form. Okay, so there's certain patients that are going to be more susceptible to having more bone loss just because of their genetics or their biotype. Okay, so inflammation and bone loss are the two things. And then with bone loss, that comes hand in hand with gingival recession. So it's similar things. All right, so clinical situations include removal of caries, etogenic crown preparation. So those are some of the reasons why. And you can probably add tooth fracture there, too, um, is something else you may see. Um, so here is a clinical example. So you can see the gingival margin around tooth number nine. That looks more angry than the adjacent teeth. And why do you think that is? Because there's a violation of biologic width, right? Yeah, good. Okay, so let's see that in a radiograph. So you see the mesial margin of that crown. You see how close that is to the bone. The body likes to have a buffer or likes to have a two millimeter biologic width in between um, so that it remains happy. Okay. So here's another example. So the biologic width in this case is tooth number nine that's been violated. And let's take a little look, a close look at the crown prep. So we said here the crown preparation should follow the contours of the gingiva. So you'll notice with your anterior teeth um, especially, and it happens in your posterior teeth too, that the shape of the interproximal gingiva isn't just flat. Right, we have what we call this papilla, this interproximal papilla that has some curvature to it. So let's take another view. So you see how there's a curvature where it kind of peaks up as you go interproximal? So you want to follow that same contour as you're prepping and you don't want to go just straight through in a straight line connecting the lingual to the um, uh, buckle. So you can see on the distal of tooth number uh, eight here, you see how the crown margin is way subgingival here because if you took the level of the prep from here to the lingual, it's essentially just a straight line across. It didn't follow this curvature that you find in its natural tooth form. So if you were to reflect the tissue back and then measure or look at the bone, you would find that there's that same curvature in the bone that the soft tissue will follow. Okay, so you see, and then if you also notice, notice how the cementum enamel junction, the CEJ, also follows that same contour in the interproximal region. All right, so when you look at your crown preps, as you go interproximally, follow the contour of the soft tissue. It's gonna go up a bit and then go down. Don't go straight across because you may violate that biologic width. So that's the principle. All right, so now we're going to talk about two different ways to treat biologic width. The first one we're going to talk about is this principle called crown lengthening. So let's walk you through the steps here. So again, we said we don't want this margin so close to the bone. So how can we solve this problem? So one is crown lengthening, which is Basically, you reflect a flap, meaning you think of it as peeling away the gum tissue, and then you remove the bone so that you can reestablish your biologic width. So we'll jump back to this slide. 
but the original question, how do we retreat it? Well, we're saying the margin's too close to the bone, so let's just get rid of the bone so it's not so close anymore. Okay? So reflect the flap. You'll pull back the soft tissue. You can take a little burr here and just start hacking away at the bone. Okay. And then you can take some hand instruments and kind of refine it, but this, the, the principle here is you remove bone away. And they have special burrs so that you can stay away from the tooth and won't damage the tooth. Um, and then you suture that back up, and then you let that heal. So as that heals, guess how far away your margin is from your bone now? Wow. It's a lot further away than it started, right? So now we're not in violation of biologic width. So after healing, this whole complex between your sulcus junction epithelium and connective tissue gets reestablished as it heals. Okay? So now the tooth is happy. The body's happy. It's got its biologic width reestablished. Okay? Pretty straightforward. Crown lengthening, right? Okay, so if we were to compare the pre versus the post-crown lengthening, let's take a look at what happens. So this is how we started off the, no, this is where we ended, right? Let's go back, yeah. Yeah, so this is after crown lengthening, right? So let's look at the, inside, the length of the tooth that's exposed. And let's compare that to where we started from. So we're looking at free gingival margin to the incisal edge. Well, after crown lengthening, which got taller? Or then the tooth looks longer now, right? Because you remove bone, which then moves, means you've removed the, um, which means that the gingival margin has migrated apically as well. So you're going to have a difference in the crown height here. So after crown length, lengthening surgery, the crown of the tooth looks longer. That's why it's called crown lengthening. Right? Things starting to make sense. We try to make it easy for you guys. The gingival margin is moved, not as moved. The gingival margin as moved is moved apically, while the incisal edge of the tooth, we maintain it at the same length, right? We haven't really altered the incisal edge. So if you're doing, let's say, an anterior tooth, you got to be cognizant of this because sometimes what you'll find is our gingival margins will be at differing levels because we've had to move the bone away or remove some of the bone. Okay. So as you're treatment planning and thinking about these cases, one of the things you want to talk about or think about is where the smile line is. And we'll get to that in a subsequent slide. Right. So when the patient smiles, you'll ask them, give me your most exaggerated smile. Or sometimes I'll tell them to grimace, because their smiles look so funny. Grimace, they kind of like, Ugh. So how high can they get their lip to come up? Right? Because if their lip never goes above that free gingival margin, then who cares what this looks like? Because the only time somebody sees that is us when we take some retractors and pull that away. Right? But let's say they have a high smile line. You know, some people when they smile, they show all their gums and then some, right? Well, in those situations, for a more aesthetic result, you're going to want to consider the gingival contour of your anterior teeth. Okay? So maybe you end up doing crown lengthening on the anterior six just to make them even, right? Um, so, anyways, the principle is. You remove bone, the crown of the tooth is going to look longer in crown lengthening, assuming that you keep the incisal edge at the same position, that you haven't altered that. All right, so that's the first way to, crown length, uh, to resolve this issue of biologic width. Uh, option number two is orthodontic extrusion. Okay, so another method of treating the violation by, by biologic width is a rapid orthodontic extrusion. So for those of you who have, you, know, you guys all know what braces are, right? You put some brackets on and then you can move the teeth around. Okay, so one way is let's just take the tooth and just pull it down. Because what happens as you pull the tooth down? Well, the margin 
moves away from the bone, which is good, right? We want a safe distance from the bone to the tooth. So we're going to erupt that with braces, essentially, and pull that tooth down. And then, obviously, that as you pull the tooth, there's bone kind of filling in that socket. But now you can reestablish your biologic width. So in this scenario, let's take a look at the difference here. So in our situation, if you do rapid extrusion, the tooth just comes a little bit longer, right? So our gingival margin looks the same. But what happens to our incisal edge as we extrude the tooth? It's going to be longer. So obviously, let's say you're doing, you know, there's tooth number eight that's an issue. Well, you don't want eight to look longer than nine. So the solution to that is, well, you just Reprep. So the incisal edge of the extruded tooth is more apical than where it started. However, the gingival margin is at the same height. So to make it to the uh, same incisal edge as where it started from, you would just simply prep the crown down more so that you uh, get it to the same height. Right. So the only thing you got to watch out for there is where your pulp is. Because, of course, we're doing more incisal reduction than may be normal, so you may end up getting encroaching upon the pulp. Okay, So that's one consideration for orthodontic extrusion. So now that we understand both methods of resolving this issue of biologic width, let's ask this question. Which scenario gives a more favorable crown to root ratio? Is it going to be crown lengthening or orthodontic extrusion? So let's just take an example of a tooth, and then we'll put just some um, arbitrary numbers here. So let's just say that the um, tooth root is about 10 millimeters, and the crown of the tooth is 10 millimeters. So that would lead us to a 10 over 10 uh, crown to root ratio, or a crown root ratio of 1. So as we go through the steps of crown lengthening, um, the idea there is that we're going to remove two millimeters of bone, uh, which will then expose two extra millimeters of the tooth. So when we do that, the crown, instead of being 10 millimeters tall, will actually now be 12. And then the root length is going to be 8, because uh, that's 10 minus 2. So if we do the math, we'd see that the crown root ratio is now 1.5. Um, so let's go and look at the orthodontic extrusion example. So again, we st start with the same scenario. So a 10 millimeter crown and a 10 millimeter long root. So in orthodontic extrusion, what we're doing is we're pulling the tooth down out of the socket. And if we do that in a rapid fashion, uh, the tooth is going to extrude without bringing any of the bone or the soft tissue with it. So when that happens, what we're going to see is that the root now, or the amount of tooth that's left in the root, is going to be 8 millimeters. And what we've done is now increase the crown uh, by 2 millimeters, because remember we're moving that tooth 2 millimeters out of that socket. Okay? Uh, but in doing so, that crown uh, incisal edge is 2 millimeters more incisal to where we started. So if, uh, most of the time, we're not going to want to um, change or alter the incisal edge position. So when we make the actual crown or prepare the crown, what we have to do is also compensate for that and we're actually going to prepare the tooth uh, and make it shorter so that we get the incisal edge length back to uh, the original length that we had started from. So by doing that, the crown length, uh, the length of the crown is going to be maintained at 10 millimeters. Um, instead of 12. So by looking and comparing at both of the methods, we can see that the uh, orthodontic extrusion will give you a more favorable crown to root ratio uh, than crown lengthening. All right, so let's talk about, about so this is stuff, this is no longer um, concepts, this is just stuff you have to know. So just spend the time to, I guess, memorize these things. Um, yeah, so let's go through it quickly. So thick normal versus thin biotype. So we talk about this when we said thinner bio, people with thinner biotypes are going to be more prone to gingival recession. 
So that's true when it comes to biologic width invasion as well as just any type of recession that you see. Okay, so with the thinner biotype, you generally see a, a thinner al alveolar housing. So look at the bone surrounding the teeth as well. Right, you see how the thin biotype also has thinner amount of bone. Okay, so there's a correlation between gingival bi biotype and the thickness of the alveolar bone. So that's that slide. And one easy way to determine if somebody has a thin biotype is, well, you put a metal probe in there, in the sulcus, and if the metal of the probe can be seen through the soft tissue, then we would consider that a thin biotype. Okay? So, of course, if it's a thicker biotype, normal or thick, that's going to mask the color of the probe underneath. So we have thin uh, and scalloped, so that's the picture on the right, versus thick and flat. Um, so that's also correlated with the amount. So somebody that has thinner and scalloped uh, tissue, you're going to see that resorb a little bit more, or you, it's going to be more likely, or you'll have a higher chance that you're going to have some recession if you violate that biologic width there. Okay, and you get those black triangles. So let's look at the papilla height. One thing that, um, one principle that we would need to understand is if you look at our facial gingiva, right? So if you were to measure the distance from the free gingival margin to the bone, what's the distance that we typically see? We would say that's three millimeters, right? One for the sulcus, one for the junctional epithelium, one for the connective tissue. So that's what that bone scallop three millimeter average designates on that left side. But when we go to your interproximal region, we notice that we have a longer distance from the tissue to the bone. So when you guys have probed your um, classmates teeth, what's sort of a typical sequence that you get in a healthy tissue? You get something like three, two, three, three, two, three, right? Or one, two, one. Or no, sorry, two, one, two, <laughs> right? So why is it that your interproximal tissue is deeper than your tissue on your straight facial? So this is the principle that we want you to know, is that your interproximal tissue is deeper, or your sulcus depth, you can think of it that way, is deeper because you have two teeth there pushing that tissue so it forms this papilla. Or in this textbook, they talk, they call it a soft tissue scallop. So there's this bean bag example, right? Let's say you had a bean bag sitting on the floor here, and you had one person sitting on the bean bag, and then another person sitting on the bean bag, and they're back to back to each other. What's gonna, what are you gonna find as they both sit on that bean bag in between their butts? Right? The bean bag is gonna come to sort of a point or an apex, you're going to have this material that kind of squishes and it gets elevated, okay, because two people are supporting that beam bag from different sides, okay, it's going to kind of pump it up just in that area. What happens when one person gets off the beam bag? Well, that area is probably going to collapse and it's going, so the principle is, interproximally you get a deeper sulcus step because the two teeth kind of push the tissue up a bit. But the minute you remove that tooth, so in this situation, we have multiple teeth missing here. What do you think the measurement of this sulcus is? One, it's going to behave like your facial tissue or gingiva because there's no tooth here supporting it. Okay, But when you have two teeth, and approximately, you're going to have a little deeper sulcus, okay? So that's why when we ask you to pack cord around a tooth for your final impressions, it's easiest to start in the interproximal region because you got a little bit more depth there that you can stuff that cord in to get it started, okay? So when adjacent teeth are removed, the interproximal gingiva will behave like the facial and lingual gingiva. The teeth no longer support the soft tissue, thus the papilla will collapse. What do you think happens when you restore the space? So in this case, we did it with implants. Well, you would think that the 
papilla would be, you'll get back to where you started from when the teeth were there, okay? So the presence of teeth will help push that soft tissue and papilla back to its form, okay? Um, so here's one of the principles that you'll have to uh, know is when, so they did a study and they measured on different people the distance between the crest of bone to where your contact point of your anterior teeth touch, right? Apical portion of the interproximal contact point. So they wanted to find out what distance um, can you have and still maintain that papilla completely filled with the soft tissue, okay? So the question is, from the contact point, and let me come here with my mouse. So there's bone underneath here, right, to this contact point. So what distance um, can you have to maintain the papilla fill in this interproximal region? Because we would say that this scenario is less aesthetic than this scenario, right? we would say that these black triangles don't look as nice because it shows that you've aged and your gum tissue has receded, whereas this looks better, okay? So that's the basis of the study. So what they did is this is the number or the distance from the bone to the uh, contact point. So three, four, five, and then the, so they took all these patients and then they measured that distance and then they took a photograph and they just said, or they ask the question, is this papilla filled? Meaning, is this triangle present or not? All right? So let's jump back to the little chart and the little study. And then, so this is the percentage of the uh, papilla present or not. So we find that if the distance from your bone to your contact point is five millimeters or less, you're pretty much going to have that papilla filled in 100% of the time. As you lose bone for whatever reason, or if the contact point is for some reason altered so that you have six millimeters, six millimeters from here to here, only 56% of the papilla, 56% uh, of the people that have this six millimeter distance will have their papilla space filled. Okay. And obviously, as that distance gets larger, you're going to have a decreasing percentage of people that have that papilla filled. Okay? So that's that principle. The distance from your bone to the apical portion of your um, interproximal contact, if you got five millimeters or less there, you're going to have your papilla filled. Papilla filled is good because in our society, we would say that this looks not aesthetically pleasing, and this looks very aesthetically pleasing. Cool? Papilla height. Okay, we also talked about gingival display, right? High smile line versus low smile line. In this situation, we probably don't have to pay as much attention if we're going to crown lengthen, let's say, to where the gingival margins are in evening those out, because whatever we do here, we get saved by the fact that their lip doesn't show it. Okay, and again, capture a picture at their exaggerated smile, not their normal, because sometimes they'll kind of smile real big and you don't want that to show. And here's an example of one that's a high smile line. In this situation, we have to be very careful about either crown lengthening or um, aesthetic parameters because, man, they can see any uh, errors that we make here. Okay, so they'll be able to see, like, for example, the junction of the tooth and the crown if we didn't prep the margin close enough to the sulcus. Or if we crown lengthen, we end up with e uneven gingival margins. Okay. All right, so average smile. So we had high, low, average. Okay, so on average, females have a higher smile line compared to males. So just know that. Incisal edge display. So we talk about where should your incisal edge be, or how much does it show at this rest position? So uh, we have two position or 
Um, the rest position is key for us in terms of that's a, um, I guess, just sort of a standard in which we can measure. Um, it's fairly repeatable, right? You get them to relax. You say relax, and where, how much of your incisal edge shows. Okay, so that can be a little bit more consistent if, than smiling, because every time they smile, maybe they'll smile at differing amounts. So it's harder to consistently measure the amount of display, right? So um, they took a bunch of patients and they split up by age group, and then they measured the amount of uh, incisor display in this repose position. So if you're 29 and younger, you're going to show a lot, right? About 3.3 of your maxillary central, and you hardly show any of your mandibular central. What happens as you age? Right? Everything starts to sag. So all your collagen and all that all breaks down, right? So your lip position is going to droop a little bit lower. That's why as people move on in age, they're going to show less and less of their central or their incisors in this repose position, and then they're going to see more and more of their mandibular teeth. Things just kind of droop as we get older, okay? So that's that principle you need to understand, incisal edge display. So when you rehabilitate somebody and you want to design crowns for them, you kind of want to consider their age because that may have an effect on their incisal edge position. Sometimes it looks funny to give a seven-year-old four millimeters of incisal edge display at this rest position. It just doesn't look natural. Okay? Or if you're designing some crowns for a young person, you don't want to hide all the tooth in that rest position. You want them to show a little bit because it makes them look more youthful. All right? Simple? Okay, males versus females. On average, females have greater incisal edge display. Of course, we want our females to look more youthful, so we want to make sure that they have sufficient display. Okay, so midline. This is an interesting study that they did. So what they did is they showed a bunch of pictures of people with differing dental midlines. Okay, so they took um, a picture and they essentially cropped it and started moving it to the patient's left side a millimeter at a time. And they showed a bunch of people, lay people, dentists, orthodontists, I think, and they said, at what point does this start to look funny? Right? So, and they did the same thing with the angulation of the tooth. Right? So they said, okay, move the incisal edge of the contact millimeter to one side. Then two millimeters, three millimeters, four millimeters. So comparing the perception of dentists and lay people to altered dental aesthetics. So what do you think they found? It was actually pretty interesting. A maxillary midline deviation of four millimeters was necessary before orthodont orthodontists rated it as significantly less aesthetic than others. However, general dentists and lay people were unable to detect even a four millimeter midline deviation. Right, so if we go back here, the bottom right picture, that's a four millimeter deviation from the midline. But the principle is, when you're looking at somebody, we can't, we don't really notice that even at four millimeters. Pretty interesting, right? However, when it comes to the cant or the angle of the midlines, what do they find there? All three groups were able to distinguish a two millimeter discrepancy in incisal, incisor crown angulation. So the principle there is as you do these anterior aesthetic cases, you gotta nail that cant of eight and nine. Because if you deviate from that just a little bit, the patient is gonna be able to pick up on it. Your dental midline, if you're off by four millimeters, man, most people can't even see that, right? And even if you look at our dental midlines as they correspond to our lower, so upper, to low, yeah, everybody take out your mirror, see if, yeah, everybody get out your camera phone, take a picture of your teeth. All right, come on, everybody, let's just humor me just for a second here. Take out your phone, take a picture of your teeth and your teeth close. How many of us have our upper and lower dental midlines off? 
Okay. So how many people notice that about your classmates? Probably not very many, okay? So as you go along in your dental career, the first, I mean, you guys are probably starting to do it a little bit already, but when you meet somebody for the first time, what do you notice about them? It's usually their teeth now, right? It's just a habit you can't break, and it's terrible because you judge people by it. So you can pick up like little things like, I'll see, oh, that's a PFM, or, oh, that's, you know, you'll pick out those things. But it's hard to tell when their dental midlines, maxillary mandibular, are off. We generally don't notice that, okay? Um, so studies are interesting because it places the emphasis on what we should be kind of honing in on, right? What are the important factors for us to create an aesthetic restoration? Right. So incisal size ledge position, that's key. The cant of the crowns is key. Some of the things that aren't as significant that maybe we don't have to worry about as much is dental midline or even gingival margins when the patient has a low smile line. Okay? So we've got to start putting these principles together. Okay? All right, so that kind of summarizes our anterior considerations um, for crown preps.